Cool. All right. Let's do a podcast episode. <laughs> I guess so, huh? It's like, how do we start? <laughs> <laughs> it's always such a We're on the pod. We're on the pod. Ew. Hello and welcome to the Open Hardware Manufacturing Podcast, the podcast about making open source hardware. My name is Stephen Hawes. And I'm Lucian Chapar. And today we are talking about the difference between working on an existing product and working on a new one. Where do you spend your time after you have shipped something already? How do you delineate between working on improving your existing stuff and working on a blue sky brand new thing? And in this one we'll cover what we call the onion of tolerance. How when you get bigger, you have more design inertia because it's harder to change things the bigger you get and the bigger your production is. Do you stick with a product that's connected to your existing customer base or do you take a risk and go into something completely different? And how all of this really comes down to focusing on what your customers care about and how the difference between those two existing versus new products matters less than what your customers really want. And uh, there will be continuing to contribute towards the ongoing theme of there's juggling here, a lot of stuff depends, mm-hmm. and everything is important. Yeah, everything. <laughs> Lucian and I have this joke that everything is important, and it's just like, we just have to pick the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard to do that, but yeah, this is this was a fun one to record. I, I'm excited about this. I learned a lot about how we view what to work on next by having this conversation. And the answer, as always, is usually pretty unsatisfying in that it's just it depends it's just gray right (laughs) but but you have to decide for yourself you have to see what works and you have to talk to your customers yeah so at the least here we'll we'll share what's worked well for us yeah yeah Um, exactly we have a pretty good sense of it now yeah yeah all right let's do it hell yeah let's do it so this episode was inspired by a question um that came in from the discord channel and it was first how do you prioritize long-term and short-term projects and they go on to say, obviously, right now, everything is probably focused on improving the existing products at Opulo and scaling production. But how much time and resources are you spending on new ideas or features? I'm sure Opulo has a laundry list of things that we want to add. How do we balance the immediate versus the future here? Yeah. And that's a, an awesome question because it is it's really hard to balance those two. So much of I think of what we are constantly doing is the finding a balance between stuff. We're trying to split the difference and not go black and white, but find the gray in between. And the answer to this is like both of them are very important. Yeah. But for different reasons. To start, let's let's talk about the R&D side of it. There's really like new products and working on developing a new product and then working on improving an existing product. Those are really the two things here, right? So first for the R&D, the new products. So there's the there's the Eisenhower matrix, which is an awesome tool for like thinking about tasks and it's a two by two matrix, kind of like a Punnett square with Mendel and his P's of importancy, importancy, importance, <laughs> Stephen G's, and uh, <laughs> urgence. So like in one box, there's tasks that are important and urgent. There are a group of tasks that are urgent and not important. There's a group of tasks that are important and not urgent. And not important and not and urgent. And not important and not urgent. So I think of R&D as important and not urgent because it's nothing that we're supporting. It's nothing that a customer's waiting on us for. I'm, in some situations, if we tell people we're working on a new thing, maybe they're waiting on us. But like, we can continue to go move forward without working on it. And it's fine, quote unquote. It's, not, it's important that we should be working on new things, but it's not urgent. It's not like we need to do it right now. There's you don't no want to rush it. You don't want to rush it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because we've seen the impacts of hiring too many engineers, scrambling, forcing something out. Yeah, like it, it needs to take the time it does. Exactly. So it's it's important that you're working on it, but it's it doesn't have like an explicit deadline. Like any deadline is self-imposed because we want it to happen within a certain time. So there's that aspect of R&D. It also requires it's much harder to work on an R&D thing because it requires a lot of market research. I did a ton of market research before I started working on the Lumen in like 2020, and we still constantly are doing it. But we have a pretty good understanding of the market for a desktop $2,000 pick and place machine. Like we know what that market looks like pretty darn well. But if we go into Crocs or like <laughs> the shoe market, let's just say like totally random through counting machine. Ex- sure. That's probably more relevant to this conversation <laughs> than shoes. But like if we were to go into a screw counting machine, we don't know what that looks like. What's important to that kind of thing? There's a lot of stuff to learn. What, what, how much are people willing to pay for it? what features are important so there's a lot of new stuff to learn that makes it harder you know yeah. whereas the opposite is something existing you know what design constraints generally are you know what the customers look like 
it's a different paradigm there entirely. Exactly. So in many ways, like working on an R&D thing is much, it's much harder to start. Improving an existing thing, you know pretty well already what it is that you need to be doing. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot more like upfront cost of like understanding those new products uh, and like what's important to people. You also don't have a choice in that you have to start with R&D, like no matter what. <laughs> that has to be the first thing. You yeah. have to make a new product. And I, well, I guess there's some exceptions. Like we were talking a little earlier about like Onsell, yeah. the company the, that's working on FreeCAD and improving FreeCAD. Like FreeCAD already existed. Exactly. They, they know how FreeCAD, and they already had a general idea of how FreeCAD could be better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't have to do as much R&D. I think they're still doing, they're building onto an existing thing with like they're fixing the top of naming problem and, you know, they're, they're adding a default assembly workbench. But they started with the baseline, so they didn't have to do a lot of R&D. But most of the time, you're going to start with this. So if you're starting out on your own endeavor, you have no choice. You have to do R&D. And then once you have the existing thing out there, then it becomes the balance. But otherwise, you'd need to work on the new thing. <laughs> otherwise, you don't have a thing. Don't have a thing? Work on yep. something. <laughs> right. And I also think it's important to, like, let's say we're, like, I put out a video a little bit ago about a reflow oven. And even though we are users of a reflow oven, we don't necessarily know all of the things that are important to a reflow oven user. It's kind of, it's a secret. It's a secret about what makes a good reflow oven. You kind of know it when you see it. When you're like, oh, this, re or a good product, I should say. When you use a product that's intuitive and nice, it's like, oh, wow, yeah, that just feels right. But it's hard to like list out all those features, you know? So you kind of have to use something that doesn't work and go, man, I wish it did X and then add X. It's, a, it's almost a fun design thinking style exercise to like analyze a product for that type of attribute. Right. So even if, we don't we use a reflow oven every day but i think i know what would make a good reflow oven but i'm not fully sure until i try the one we make you know what i mean right so it there it's just r&d's a lot it <laughs> takes it there it's a lot more than just like plunking around with the design it's like the whole market side and like can yeah. we sell it and i think a lot of really brilliant engineers can get lost in the innovation side and a lot of it is the software skills and talking to people understanding what's out there researching extensively Right. Knowing that what you make is contributing to a marketplace or an industry in a new way. Right. Like you don't want to spend all this time just re-engineering something that works the same. Like it's about improving and moving the needle here. Exactly. And the way I've heard that described is it's people falling in love with the solution and not with the problem. Like I, I did like the idea of building a pick and place machine. But if I realized halfway through building the Luma is like, oh, building a, a machine doesn't make sense. It's actually like a marketplace of people that can hire other CMs that makes it a lot cheaper to like hire a contract. That's what we would have built. Like, it's not like we're building the pick and place because the pick, I mean, the pick and place is fun to build, but it's more about solving the problem is really what matters. And I, I agree. I think a lot of people, when they go into R&D, they just think it'd be cool if I had X, it'd be fun to design <laughs> this. And it's like, well, yeah. And if that's for a personal project, hell yeah, go after it, make a cool, wacky thing. But if it's for a market, you got to know that people want this. Like, is it solving a problem for people first? Yeah, these first principles here are incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to build a house on a bad foundation. Like, exactly. take that time. Yeah. Like we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So if we're going into a new thing, we have to spend a ton of time. And that's why we're even, I was working on that reflow oven design recently is because people have said to us in all of our customer interviews, like, yeah, this isn't really a good turnkey. I mean, the, the Control EO3 is really good. Reflow Master is great, but it needs a little setup. But it's not quite what people are looking for for our customer base. So, you know, we, we, we've kind of passively eked our way into some market research there, which is kind of cool. Because we focus on an existing product, you can see what demands and needs and shortfalls it has and like what new products are necessitated by an existing product's existence. True. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Like if we hadn't had the Lumen be out in the world for a year and a half, two years now, we wouldn't know what's important in a reflow oven necessarily. You know, like back then we were still like conveyor belts the move. <laughs> and now it's like, okay, conveyor belt is like objectively not a good solution for a desktop system. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But it took us shipping the Lumen, an existing product, for a while to be able to understand that what that meant for other R&D projects. Right. That's a really good point. Yeah. So maybe we should even touch on like, why didn't the Lumen launch with feeders and a conveyor belt? I think we're kind of saying it because... We started with the first thing that was useful to people. 
Yeah, we started with like the minimum viable thing that would be handy to have. And we let the market inform what comes with it next or what's made for it next. Rather. Exactly. Like when after we launched the first I maybe I've talked about this on the podcast before, but when we we shipped those that first batch of like 100 and change machines of V2, the build your own, you print your own parts kits. And I interviewed like 50 customers after that. And I was like, what were the biggest problems? Like, what did you not like about it? And that has informed what we've worked on for the past ye- two years. Like we're, we're checking off boxes that people told us March 2022 when we started shipping those kits, you know, but shipping something, just getting something out there and having people do that is a great way to like have it engage with with people very quickly, get that feedback and improve upon it. So like maybe our R&D is the pathway to getting to something that you feel like you can put out the door and is still helpful to people. But you know that once people get it in their hands, they'll help you work on the existing product part. Yeah. And like the original question is back to prioritizing long term versus short term projects. And yeah. like the long term project is to make circuit boards easier to make at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So everything kind of falls into that. Exactly. And even for the long term project of the Lumen, like V2 of like the print your own parts kit, that's a short term project of getting that thing out the door and then realizing, oh, people hate having to assemble this thing. Another short term project is making it come almost fully assembled. And that was another short term project still with the, the long term goal of trying to make SMT assembly easy. And cheap. Yeah. Whenever we're talking about the R&D here, I, I think about like, what's the next plateau that we need to get to? Yeah. So like, how do we chunk it up exactly like you just described here? Right, right, right. So uh, R&D is like, obviously, it comes first when you need to get something out the door because you need something for people to interact with to be able to improve upon it. But that balance of like, where do you draw that line is tricky too. like how baked does it need to be before it goes out and you start getting feedback on it? And that's what's kind of nice about having an open source community is that people will build it and they'll be like, hey, fix this stupid mistake (laughs) and then we can fix it before we ship stuff, which is cool. But yeah, we we pretty much always have a few things going on at a time in R&D world, like explorations of different things. We're never not working on a new product. We're never not interviewing customers and asking them what's going on and what's a problem for them and what would be helpful for them to have. But there are times where it's like not our main focus. You know, there are times where we are just working on improving the existing product and we're putting R&D on the back burner. Yeah. I'd love to have us try talking about like how does money influence this conversation? Like cash flow. Right. Yeah. Like that's pretty, (laughs) you need money to sell a thing. Yeah. And money influences a lot of decisions. If anything, it's one of the biggest drivers of our course. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. Cause like we still want to keep existing. (laughs) (laughs) That's kind of nice. We still have to keep the lights on. So yeah, I think a lot about the onion of tolerance is what I call it of like the inside of the onion of tolerance is people who are willing to put up with a pain in the butt. Those are the people who bought our V2 kit where they had to print all the parts themselves. They had to spend all these hours assembling the thing. They did all the cow from scratch. It was like they had a really high tolerance for this. And then it's like, okay, what's the next shell? What's the next Shrek ogre layer of that onion (laughs) (laughs) that of like, what's the most annoying thing to people? Oh, well, putting it together really stinks. They hate the umbilical. The the umbilical was rough for people. (laughs) Like that was one of the most frequently said things to us is like the umbilical was really hard to like sheath and do all that. It was a pain. So what's the lowest hanging fruit is really kind of the way to say it. What's the most frustrating thing? Finding that, fixing that problem. Okay, well, then what's the next one? Now it comes almost fully assembled. Assembly is easy. What's the next thing? Well, strip feeders. Strip feeders are rough. Okay, the next shell of that onion is I don't want to have to pull strip feeders through. I just want powered feeders to do for me. So then we work on feeders. Right. So it's kind of going up on in that shell. And what that gets you, like I'm getting, eventually I promise I'm getting around to your point here, of money is that there's a small niche group that are willing to put up with that initial difficult setup. And then as you grow and you expand, you find more people who have less tolerance that are, are willing to put up with less and less, but we have a more and more sorted solution as time goes on. And that's worked out really well for us for still being able to make money. You know, like we're selling the thing that requires a lot of work to start and that's a smaller niche. And then as we grow, we become more and more accessible to more people as we solve those problems. Yeah. And uh, as we build out, it creates like revenue streams that, that, that can help us to afford the development costs of things that are less important, less urgent, still add value to the user. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's a bit about the R&D. Let's talk about existing stuff. Uh, like when we ship something, because I think that's where the majority of our thinking lives right now is existing stuff. We do spend a lot of time thinking about new projects and we, we always have them burning. But most of the time we're thinking about our existing users, our existing product, improving our existing product. That's where a lot of our time goes. For sure. So 
following the Eisenhower matrix of things, it's important and urgent. A lot of people have a lumen in the world and <laughs> we want to make it better for them. You know, uh, we also want to make it better for people who want to buy a lumen tomorrow. So it is not only is important to do it, it's also like People use it every day, and we could make it better for people every day if we made some improvements. We can even make it better for ourselves. We're a huge user, and better can even mean like making it easier to manufacture. And that also benefits the people that build it from the source. Right. That's an interesting point. Is like, who are we actually improving it for? When we improve an existing product, are we improving it for people who already have the product? So like if it's a software update and people already have a lumen and then they just get more features, like Prusa just released input shaping for the Prusa Mini. That's existing customers just get a better product. And then there's existing customers, maybe an upgrade kit or like when we launch V3 of the machine, it has two heads instead of one. We also had a pump and valve kit so people could upgrade their V2 to V3. So that's improving it also for existing customers. And then there's just if we make a better version of the machine, someone who buys it tomorrow gets a better version of the machine. Yeah. Um, So that's new customers. And we have to consider all the people at different depths of the onion here. Yeah. Some customers will reprint parts every time we've changed an FDM component. Some what they got in the box is going to be what they use in perpetuity. For forever. And they don't have a printer. They don't want to futz with it. They just want to have the thing set up and running. And we have to consider all those people when we think about improving it. If you want to reprint all the parts, you should be able to do that. If you just want to throw money at the problem and buy something to put feeders on your V2, you should be able to do that too. Yeah, that's fine. I respect for either way. Yeah. Tool or project. Yeah, exactly. And like they have the right to treat our machine as a tool. I think it's also important to say that we are kind of unique here in this thing because we can update our hardware so fast. We have all of our SMT in-house Boards come in a week if we need to change a PCB design. We 3D print almost all of the unique parts and like all of the other things like the pumps and valves and like aluminum extrusion are pretty easily configurable for different stuff. So we can release a ton of little small updates so easily. So it's really easy if we see a tiny improvement, we can just roll it out. No problem. We don't carry a huge amount of inventory on anything custom and the lead time, the longest lead time on something, I think it's a motor, six weeks. We have time. That's pretty good. Yeah. So within six weeks, we could fundamentally change any attribute of our machine. And as long as there wasn't a large scrap inventory issue, Mm -hmm. like we can change anything. Yeah. Apple can't do that. Well, I mean, Apple has more money than God. So like they can do whatever they want. But but once they ship a piece of hardware, that's like kind of it. The first day that the iPhone 15 goes on for sale, millions are purchased and millions of people have it. And like it's out there, you know, there's no rolling improvements I don't think (laughs) or or if they are, they're very small. You know, it's like you can't change an injection molding die that significantly. You know, you can do do mold changes and stuff, but these things are so set. There's so much infrastructure around making them happen. You can't just make those little tweaks. Maybe it's about scale, too, because they're just so big. We're at a very cute production volume where we can have that flexibility pretty easily. Yeah. If we're at a larger scale, the lead times on motors would probably be 15 weeks because we're buying in such high volume. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Where if we had a million dollars worth of PCBs, all right, UpRev hits next year, 2025. <laughs> exactly. With scale comes inertia. If we're still small, we can change things pretty quickly. So, I mean, I guess you see that like in smaller companies, they'll work more on maybe they have more flexibility in working on existing products instead of making new ones because. The scale for making something at such a large quantity means you, it's a lot harder to roll out small incremental change. It's just more frustrating. So like right. from a very pragmatic standpoint, let's say we were shipping a million lumens a year, mm-hmm. there'd be a hundred times more lumens on the production line probably at any given time. Sure. And the cut-ins of changes would be a nightmare to manage. Right. Because there'd be sub-assemblies that are this version and sub-assemblies that are that version, and right. it'd be it'd be almost impossible to clear the facility of lumens for a clean changeover. There's so many whip. It would be so hard to clear it out. Yeah. So we really do have this benefit then by being small. Yeah. And we can cleanse our palate of a version and just start making the next one. But sure. what if we had to think about like, oh, we're upriving the feeder, but we need to deplete this 1000 stock of the old feeder PCBA. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's hard to balance. Yeah. Um, the mixed revision, mixing revisions on the line would become a little bit more of a hindrance. And that's probably why these larger companies become slower. There's all that inertia, like you were saying. Yeah. And that's probably why they have release cycles that are so like we, we release a new version of the car every year or we release Apple comes out with a new iPhone every year. <laughs> you know, four months comes out with a new printer. It's that printer. And that's it, you know, because it's so much to just deploy it for us. It's so easy. 
You know, we, we finished shipping a batch. And we just, okay, we're making this new one. We can print those parts same day, have them built in Illumin that afternoon. And then there we go. We've made a switch. We're weird here. <laughs> I think that's important to say. Like when you're doing things the way that we are doing them, it's not standard. Like I think most of the time the structure is you work on R&D, you work on R&D, you tune it, you perfect it, you get it done, you ship it. Maybe you do a little bit of firefighting to fix some bugs, but then you're moving on to R&D. And we can constantly be doing, it's kind of still R&D on existing products. We're still improving. It just happens to be the same product line, which is cool. And uh, call it like the inertia that you have or like the hindrance to change things at different volumes. It doesn't have to be volume related. Like think, for example, let's say we manufactured parachutes Mm -hmm. and a customer (laughs) goes, this stitch pattern is ugly. Can I have this one instead? It's like, well... Let's think, how much testing in rigor would it be to <laughs> change the stitch pattern in a parachute? Like, right. <laughs> I think about this with Form Labs and their biocompatible resins because the certification process they had to go through, I was very, I was pretty removed from it, but I was privy to it. It was extensive to make sure, like they go through all this testing. They have like such rigorous standards. It was really cool to see. But if they want to change the formulation in that, it's like tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in cost. Like it's incredibly, exp- I, that's a guess. I don't really know how much, but it's, it's thousands upon thousands of dollars. So you really want to get it right. <laughs> you know, if you have to make a change, th- there's a different relationship. That, that is really interesting. Like if, if you're still small, you can roll out all these little incremental releases. And then as you get bigger and things kind of, I've been using the word coagulate too much in podcast episodes recently, but it's such a good word as they solidify, <laughs> as they, you know, become more and more like, okay, this is a good approach. This is the way we should do it. You don't need to make releases as often because things are pretty stable. You know, Voron is also an interesting one to consider here because they're not really a company. They're kind of a company. They're not a company, TM. Oh, is that really what they, <laughs> is, do they say that? It's a bit of a joke. That's funny. More of a foundation or a, a, a group, a group, people of an aligned goal. Right. And so the way that they work on R&D versus existing stuff is like kind of whatever, because sometimes they'll work on a brand new thing and sometimes they improve the heck out of an existing. Like I think about the 0.1 and now there's the 0.2. That's an existing platform. And then they made improvements, you know, there's no real roadmap that I've seen. There's no product managers. There's no market informed decisions. It's a bunch of really passionate, obsessed engineers trying to make the best printer they can. Cost be damned. uh, Assembly time be damned. Yeah. They're prioritizing the best printer they can make. Right. And I, that's, it's really cool. It is really cool. And th- what, what's cool about it is they don't have to really think about manufacturing. If LDO makes a kit for Voron, then they figure out how to take the Voron design and turn it into something that you can sell. But they just make what they make. Like they, it's purely design freedom. They just do what they want. And then people have to figure it out, which is kind of a cool approach. But it also makes it a lot harder to build. And that's why they say Vorons are built, not bought. It's hard to get a Voron. And they'll even go as far as making beautiful CNC parts of a high degree of finish, like insane anodized and etching, yeah. all the, the details you could ever ask for Yeah, at the lowest production volume. Yeah. It's so bespoke. It's, it can be so custom. It's such an art. And it's not a company, so they don't have the same overheads as something like Opula may have. Sure. They have customer support in that it's a Discord community willing to help each other. Yeah. But almost no Vorons built the same from unit to unit. Sure. Like they're each a little different. Yeah. There's no standard. <laughs> I, I, you know, this, this conversation is making me feel like talking about R&D versus existing products is a misnomer because I'd consider all the improvements you just made to the Lumen with 3.1 and all the linear rails and all the upgrades that you gave it, that's still R&D. It's just existing products versus new products. That's really the delineation. How much are you focusing on an existing product versus a new product? It's all still R&D. You know, it's all still like development. It's just what product line? How how often are you taking a jump into a new product line is really what it's about. Yeah, engaging when it's worth building one out. Yeah, exactly. So like in the form labs context, maybe that's more of like they've been working in SLA. And what if we go into SLS and then they came out with Fuse and like how much resources did they put into doing that? How important was that? That's more of, I think, how, how this alignment goes, because you're always doing designing. You're always working on building and making things better. It's Do you stick with the existing customer base that you know is consistent or are you taking the risk? Right. And uh, I think from what we saw there, it was they'd put their toes in the water and they'd walk in slowly. Yeah. Like it start with a really smart engineer working alone or with an intern in a closet. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. And as something got legs and it looked like it'd be more of a thing when they get that assurance that it will be a product one day, they hire more. When they have a ship date for a product, they're. There's a full team, there's product managers, they're feverishly working on it. Yeah. But 
they had to build that confidence that it'd be something they they could sell. It's something worth investing in. Sure. That people could actually use. Sure. And they had to convince themselves the same. It almost makes me think like Formlabs could only hire all the people to work on Fuse when SLA made the company enough money to pay for an entire R&D team that wasn't making money. And that's kind of what we did on a hilariously smaller scale. You and I were building the first kit of Lumens. And then once we made enough money that we could hire people to build Lumens, the company was making enough money we could afford to go work on new projects. So when your original product line makes you enough money that you can justify working on a new thing, it's time to start thinking about it. You know what I mean? Do you agree with that? Yeah. I'm trying that on as I say it. Everything's important. Yeah. Like we always joke. Yeah. Um, you have to make money to research more things. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different game when there's already revenue involved here. Right. Yeah. And that's really the theme of existing products. Like, yeah, they have to propel you forward. They have to free up that space and time to hire enough support mm -hmm. to let the engineers not build it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, it's kind of a, a bird in the hand worth two in the bush. Totally personified. When you have an existing product that people are buying, working on that is taking the bird in the hand. You know people like it. You know you have product market fit. You know it's working for people. You know what problems to work on and make it better for people. That is an easy win. You know that working on an existing product is going to improve your customer base. It's going to improve how people use your product. But the two in the bush is like, well, we could make this other thing that might have crazy returns and it's going to be really useful, but it's a gamble. Yeah, the, the prospect of selling feeders and designing feeders for Opulo and the Lumen PMP ecosystem was such a no-brainer. It's worth saying it, but we have a machine ecosystem that will accept all these feeders in varying widths. We know that people will buy them. Each mm -hmm. Lumen can have up to 50. That's yeah. potentials of tens of thousands of feeders that there's market demand for. Sure. So if we make a size, it'll be a no-brainer to hire assembly techs for it. Right. Like the, the demand is there. Yep. But the benefit of having these existing products is that we know there's fit we right. we know we have an ecosystem that would accept these new products. There's far less risk in developing existing products further by sure. making more feeders. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's but that's technically a new product. Yeah. So feeders are actually a great example here because at what point did we decide, OK, we focus all of our attention on feeders for like six to eight months. And like the Lumen was effectively like 304, 305 for a while. Yeah. While we were focusing on getting eight millimeter feeders out. Is it was, that fair to say? No, it was earlier because as soon as I was up and running with FreeCAD and like comfortable editing the Lumen and you had the Rev4 Mobo done, mm -hmm. I think you shift gears strongly into feeders. You're right. I remember right. that whole late conversation. Right. Because I, I had like a prototype at Electronica in like last November, like a year ago. Yeah. And we so. were shipping by the end of April 2023. Wait, that's crazy. That yeah. was like five months. Yeah. You just went in on feeders. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's we're, right. Because... Frankly, back to what we were saying, we were at Electronica, we were talking to people who were interested in the lumen, and we were realizing how much of a, like, how imperative it is to have the feeders on this machine. Yeah. The people at Electronica run large tech companies, they have engineering R&D teams, they right. weren't going to be bothered with strip feeders when we could make a feeder for it. Sure. And it became so obvious that it was so important. Yeah. Yeah. So... It <laughs> Yeah, that, that is really true. And, and that goes back to the onion of tolerance. Like, it almost doesn't matter if it's an existing product or a new product. It's about what's the customer need. If the most annoying thing to the customer is that the existing product has a bug, fix that bug. Yeah. If the most important thing to the customer is that there isn't this accessory and, hey, I want this whole new product, make that new product. This is so interesting. I kind of never thought about it this way, but like making the, the Lumen be easily assemble like the v3 version of the machine that was improving an existing product feeders were a brand new product but i have not thought about them that separately really <laughs> because it's always about what do people want yeah so you kind of don't even think about it yeah the back half of the onion is like tailoring to existing customers with existing solutions and then like attracting what could bring in a new person yeah, that, that's a good point. Like, we're going to come out with 12 mil feeders real soon. We're like gearing up to, to start shipping them. And 12 millimeter feeders, I know for a fact there are people who are like waiting to buy a Lumen because 12 millimeter feeders are not a thing yet. And once they are, they're in. There's something about like making the sales for it. But inevitably, if you're solving the problem better for more people, you will have more sales from that too. They go hand in hand. Yeah, no, and it's all great stuff. Like, um, the company makes things on a mission to aid in manufacturing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that so like right now we have feeders out 12s coming out. We're also working on like other feeder widths because that's still important to people, but not as much as like making the software process easier. 
that's another thing like setting up open PNP and like I just finished shooting a whole like walkthrough video of like setting up a job. Yeah. And that's the current low hanging fruit. So that's kind of considered existing products. But in many ways, it really doesn't matter if it's improving an existing product or if it's making a new thing. It's what is the most important thing to your customer right now? What are they frustrated with and working on that? Yeah. And sometimes the most important thing can be like boring for an engineer to make. Yeah. For bringing it to what we're doing now. Like it's not the most important to make the Lumen even faster than it is in 3.1. It's more important to have it well documented with good video content that aids in setup. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Because most of most of our customers, I mean, 3.1 3.1 is so much faster than 3.05. I'm so, it, it's, so, it's so much better. But if people don't care about it being faster, but they care about it being easier to put together or easier to set up the job or whatever, that's what we should be focusing on. Yeah. So it's, it's almost in have, we have to have that focus and we have to have, I don't want to say maturity. It's important for us to be pragmatic and think about the system here. Like we don't want to get distracted in like the shiny new bell and whistle feature. Exactly. That's about refining exactly what's out there. And that's really how we make good hardware and we keep our customers happy. Yeah. Is doing what they want. What's (laughs) going to be useful to them, you know? If I find myself this sounds kind of sad, but take it for how I mean it. If I find myself being really excited to work on something here, I have to stop myself and ask is this the best thing to be working on? I have a thing on my notion board of like, I forget exactly what it says, but it's like, what am I doing today to make manufacturing people's products easier? Like the, the thesis of the company. Yeah. And if I'm not working actively on that, I'm acting out of what's fun to work on and not <laughs> what's most important to work on. And like you say, getting distracted by the shiny thing is like I working on the, the reflow oven was really fun. But before I started working on that board, I spent a lot of time going, is this actually the most important thing for me to be spending my time on right now? Yeah. And I've, I've yanked you off that ledge hard before. <laughs> like, of me wanting to do something fun. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Like anytime a programming jig breaks... <laughs> Like it's so I know it's so tempting for us to just double down on making it better. Oh, on like completely redoing it. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see your point. And sometimes just patching that and moving on is the thing you have to work on. You know, keeping in mind the thesis of what we're trying to do will really help inform. Are you working on a new product or are you working on an old one? And so a lot of this is really doing customer interviews. I think this is really where a lot of this comes down to is listening to your community. When I see someone in discord repeatedly saying, hey, this I'm having this problem with this thing or this is confusing. Or when I run customer interviews and I ask them what was the most frustrating thing about this and I have all this like this spreadsheet of graphing out what do they use it for, what target market are they in, what's important to them, what feature do they want, what bug is annoying to them. And I have, I have it all graphed out to optimize for like what improvement, what thing could be, we be working on that net improves the product for everybody or improves the problem of manufacturring your products better for everybody. Yeah. And ideally we make things that address all of those people at once. Exactly. Yeah. That's a that's the biggest win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we can find something that's just a big sweeping thing for everyone, whether it's a new product or it's working on an existing one and improving, adding a feature or fixing a bug on an existing one, that's what we do. <laughs> it's kind of no question. Yeah. And of course, there's going to be times where we have to dive into a specific vertical or specific niche. Like mm-hmm. an education customer at a makerspace might not care about the limit integrating of an inventory management system, but an enterprise customer that's using it on a production line they're going to really love that. Exactly. So like, and, <laughs> and, and that's where the balance thing comes in. Cause there's still things that we could do to make the lumen better, but I still took some time to make a PCB to control a reflow oven. And you kind of still have to balance it. If we always just worked on the lowest hanging fruit, we wouldn't be keeping irons in the fire, working on new stuff and considering new things. Even if there is lower hanging fruit, eh, maybe go up a couple branches and pick something else (laughs) because you should still be thinking about those things. You should keep those irons in the fire and keep them moving along. Even if there is still a a pretty low hanging fruit to be working on, that's where most of your time should go, but not all of it. You should still be thinking about this other thing. Yeah. And on the manufacturing side of that, for me, sometimes it's kicking the can and keeping that can being kicked. I might have an initiative with our shaft collar vendor, for example, to try and make the feeder wheel one piece. Right. They're going to need plenty of time to chew on that problem, get the tooling made. Like, right. I might as well keep their momentum going yeah. and let them keep working on that. So if I keep them moving, they'll have samples for me or to review every eight, 12 weeks. Sure. I'm leaning on our suppliers to do some innovation so I don't have to. Yeah. It's parallelizing. Like if you know in a year I'd love to have X, Y, Z. Well, you should probably kick off the things that take eight months, <laughs> <laughs> at yeah. least eight months before that, you know? So th- there are some things where it's not like, oh, I can just put 
you know that that joke that like project managers think that nine women can have one baby in one month <laughs> it's like oh you yeah. can just throw more people on a problem and get done it's like no some things just take x amount of time you cannot speed up how long it takes to see ship that just takes the boat can't go fast the boat goes as fast as it goes it's not going faster so you kind of have to start those things early so that's another reason to kind of be thinking ahead on that way. I'd say you and I probably sit down every two to three weeks and have a pretty good blue sky conversation of like, what if we did X, Y, Z? What if we had this product line? What if we did this crazy wild thing? Yeah. Probably more often than that, even at least every two weeks we sit down. And, have and it's really ones. important. Yeah. Like I just got back from Earth. I saw almost a new theme of closed loop monitoring with like servo motors driving machines. Right. And we had a good conversation about the merits, the pros and cons. Yeah. We should always assess if we're on the right path, just like anyone should be assessing if their existing products cover the needs of their customers, their users, or if something new is warranted. Yeah. If we're leaving it on the table, if, if we're resting on our laurels and we're like, it's good enough, people are happy with it now. Well, what if something else comes out that's better? To just sit and be like happy with what we have already is like, well, we could be making it better. <laughs> like, if is there some new technology, like the Piopoli, uh linear motor printer? I forget so what the cool. name of it. It's so cool. It's like no belts, no steppers. It's like an unwrapped stepper on the rail. It's really cool. And so if that's a new thing and the price could be coming down on that and it becomes more ubiquitous, we should be thinking about, is that a, a valid approach? Is that going to make sense for us? Is I don't want to let some new thing slip us by. We should be aware of everything happening at, the, at a time because it might take eight months to get those magnets in, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I thought it was fascinating when we were looking at 3.1 and the machines that come thereafter. You built out a Google spreadsheet that really did, took, took us down to brass tacks and first principles like, hey, what is this feature? How much faster would it make the machine? Characterizing how it would improve the machine mm -hmm. and then us uh, putting that against like the engineering time to develop it. Right. And I thought if you if you want to explain. Are you talking about the comparison between the XYY and the yeah, core XY motor? fascinating for yeah. us. So there's a really great thing that I recommend anyone that's working on any kind of product do is write what's called a PRD. And a PRD is a product requirements document. And before we work on anything here, we've written this document. And what it outlines is who's using it, what's important to them, what problems does it solve? And it's very unopinionated about how it gets solved. It's very hands off. It's just like it needs to do X, Y, Z. I don't care if it's a drone picking up parts with a nozzle and placing it down with a bunch of cameras. I don't care if it's trained pigeons, the lumen or a trained pigeon. I don't care about the execution. It's about what constitutes a successful product. And that is so informative. So what we have in our PRD for the lumen is all about what's important to our user base, what actually matters to people. And this is based on customer interviews and people saying stuff in discord and a lot, a lot of customer interviews <laughs> of what do people say is important to them. And that lets us weigh what is going to be the best choice for how we design the thing. So the best example is we were looking at, do we switch the Lumen to Core XY? Which, if you aren't familiar, it's a, it's a way of use two motors, not one for the X-axis and one for the Y-axis. Both of them move both axes. So there's an A motor and a B motor. And if you, I think if you spin the A motor, it moves the head diagonally. Yeah, I recommend looking up a GIF. Yeah, well, look at a GIF. It's so weird to say. <laughs> and right now we have an XYY configuration, as I call it, where we have one motor for the X and two motors for moving the whole Y gantry. And so I graphed out what's the acceleration performance, how much faster could we go if we switched to Core XY. It ended up being quite a bit worse because with Core XY, you only have two motors instead of three with our current config. So we actually move quite a bit faster with our current setup. Let's say Core XY was faster than what we currently have. Core XY is a pain in the butt to route the belts for. And if we do it in our current way, we can ship the X gantry and the Y gantries separately pre-belt routed. And all people have to do is put four bolts together and they're connected. And it's great. But if we were to ship a Core XY machine, we'd have to ship a box that's twice as big. It would cost twice as much. Or if it was a smaller box, we'd have to ask customers to route Core XY. Yeah, and how much money would we be spending in support to route debugging their, route, their ex routing? Exactly. Like, that's <laughs> a huge pain in the butt. So, and it's not a good customer experience. It's not solving the problem of, like, this should be, just be a tool. So we made the decision of, and it was really easy because Core XY was actually not as good as our current setup, but even if it were faster, what's going to be better for what people care about? That tiny bit of speed increase doesn't matter to most people using the machine. It's not CPH, it's reliability that people care about and, and ease of setup the job. That's really the, what people care about doing. It'd be a more expensive for them. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Even though we might be loop leaving some performance on the table in that way, all the other variables that go into it didn't make sense. So there's a long way of saying 
having a PRD and having like, if it doesn't do this, we do not ship this product because it doesn't do what our customers want is imperative. So like I recommend looking up PRD examples. Like there's a lot of really good templates and each person's going to write one differently, but it's so good to have that as a ground truth. And to take it a little bit more back to the question, writing up these PRDs, doing some first principles, engineering analysis, features and capabilities helps us decide what to work on. Even like scratch pad back of the napkin math can show that, hey, this feature is a no brainer. It's imperative we work on it, even if it takes eight months. Or yeah. This really good idea is not worth doing, even if it takes us a month as a short term project. Yeah. Exactly. The more you can bring it down to like a quantitative decision mm -hmm. where emotions like reduced, yeah. where the influence of emotions reduced, like the clearer you can think about it. Yeah. I, I think a lot about the Pareto rule, which is like the 80, 80, 20 rule where like 80% of the value comes from 20% of the work. And what's the thing we can do to get the most potential output from the quickest and least amount of effort? Like how can we make things better the quickest and easiest? And at some point, like getting that last 20%, or if you really want to take it like 99%, if that's going to take three years to get that last 1%, yeah, maybe we burn on that a little bit, but, eh, you know, there's other problems to solve, <laughs> you know? An another really big thing about focusing on your existing products and making them really great, like a reef Lovin is like a very holistically separate product from the feeders because the feeders are an accessory to the Lumen. It makes the Lumen better. So it's still kind of the same product line, but a reef Lovin is a completely new thing. Like it's still the same customer, but it's it's a brand new product. Part of the reason why waiting to get one of those out the door and focus on the existing thing first is that if you have bugs in your original product that you've shipped and that's people's perception of it, that you're not taking care of your first products and, and fixing it, that's not going to be good for shipping a new thing. Like if you're not making sure your first thing is really good, I'm not going to buy a second product from a company that I bought <laughs> the first thing from and it was crap. You know what I mean? Right. So like it, it's also about like the company perspective. Like how do people view you and the quality that you put into things? Who's going to buy your second thing? Like put first things first. Get the good, excellent thing out there first and then think about something else. You know, we would not have sold nearly as many feeders as we've had uh, out there as the V2. Like think about the amount of That's asks be on our customers. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Spend 10 hours getting this together. Yeah. <laughs> and then install these feeders, then get it working. Yeah, no way. Like that, that's a really good point. So that's a, maybe a good tool to use for thinking about what thing to ship. What would be silly? Like if we ship feeders and then we shipped a fully assembled machine, people would be like, <laughs> okay, so I have to spend eight hours putting this machine together. And then I put the feeder. Like, no, the, you, you solve first things first. The machine should just come. A feeder is useless without there being a lumen out there. Yeah. You, your point, your bullet point there was talking about like, you want to sell something refined before you sell something new. Yeah. And the, I kind of pulled it into, you don't want to sell an accessory before we have the entree. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a great way to think about it too. For example, we shipped V2 of the machine, which was a kit. Then we shipped V3.0, which was almost fully assembled, but still used rollers. And it was a great machine and still is, but you couldn't go as fast. And then we thought feeders were next important. And then we launched three one, which is the machine, but it's way faster and easier to put together and like all that kind of stuff. So there was a point where we're like, OK, this product has advanced enough that now the next thing to work on is a accessory. So, yeah, like there was still performance on the table when we decided to focus on feeders. But it was based on what do people care about the most? You know, people wanted feeders more than they wanted the machine to go faster. <laughs> so that's what we worked on. And now they want it to go faster. And now that's what we're working on. It's a leapfrog game of cat and mouse. Yeah. What's the lowest hanging fruit? What's the thing? And like, let's say what everyone was saying in our customer interviews was like, yeah, I don't care about the machine going faster. The rollers are fine. Don't bother with the linear rails. I love the feeders. I just want a good reflow oven. Maybe we wouldn't have worked on the linear rail lumen. Maybe yeah. we would have just started working on the reflow oven because that's what people cared about the most. The more we talk about this, the more I'm realizing that like existing products and new products kind of doesn't matter at all. <laughs> it really kind of doesn't. It's about what is the most important to your customer. Yeah. What is the thing that's going to help them the most? That's what you work on. If it's an existing thing, if it's not an existing thing. And again, it's really easy for us to make an improvement to our existing products and other people might not have that luxury. So th that's an asterisk here. I but. do have another angle to take it though. Okay. Um, we're an open company. We're an open hardware company. Yeah. Because we get our products out there, the more we get them out there, the more we have people improving them. Getting more lumens out to people means there's more people thinking about them and developing for them. Yep. 
by selling more lumens, we're getting more people wanting feeders. There's more people willing to test feeders. We had people building lumens from source before we had sold anything. Yeah. And that's imperative. That's super handy. Mm -hmm. Because we shifted out to the V3.1 with mm -hmm. linear rails was inspired by a community mod. Yep. That wouldn't have existed if we weren't open. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Like the <laughs> fact that the source is out there and Thea, Stargirl, made this awesome mod to the Lumen that add linear rails. Like that was the, the foundation of you upgrading the CAD. I think you imported her CAD yeah. and like modified that. Some of her models are still in there. Yeah. It's purely pulled from the community. And so this is a tough balance too. Is like you don't want to get something out the door that is not fully baked because you're going, oh, the community will fix it. And like, I'll just merge in their stuff because you don't want to sell something that stinks, you know, but you do want it to be good enough that it's still useful to people and they enjoy using it, but they will still give you feedback on how to make it better. And that's a tough line to draw. Yeah, we, we try not to sell something that requires improvement to be functional. Like that's that's not what we're about. We, right. Everything we sell needs to work if there was never another PR. Yes. It, it needs to be like evolution. Every single improvement is a step function in being better and it will never it will never go backwards, right? <laughs> ideally. Yeah. Yes. I, yes, ideally. But it's because we can put something out there and give the community something to chew on. Like they will propel it. They'll move that ball forward for us and create that time also to focus on the new product. Right. If the community is helping us improve existing, it, it kind of carves out some space and we we can see what the community does with an existing product for a couple of months and then look back at how it's been proved. There are so many community mods for the V3 that mm. didn't take. Like there's drag chain for XY people are trying out. Mm. People have tried different fiducials at different heights, putting nozzle racks on the feeder rail and moving the power supply and the computer to under the staging plate. Like yeah. we've, we've seen them try out so many ideas and yeah. we have the benefit of patience to decide what of it we want to yoink back for v3.1 and what's going to apply to most every user you know because some people customize it to be specific for their very specific use case but what's like a generalizable what will work for everybody that also i think informs a lot of what like if you look in our prd about the lumen people caring about speed part of our evidence of like yeah we should make linear rails on the lumen and make it go faster is because Dozens of people use <laughs> Thea's mod. Obviously, people care about it because people went out of their way to follow her instructions, buy linear rails, take down their machine they're using for production, add in the rails. Like, that, what a strong signal that that's something we should integrate. You know what I mean? Yeah, we were even seeing what did it for me is seeing people mod their stock from Opula Lumen. Yeah, like they got it in the mail, immediately put linear rails on it, and then they put it together. Yeah, and I like, was like, okay, sh yeah, like, on the wall. There. We, sh we, should, we should do that. Like, there's no <laughs> question. So, looking at your community is also a really good indicator of like, if they're doing a mod very consistently, you should do that thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that, that's, a, that's a pretty strong signal. That's a thing to be spending effort on. Yeah, there's mods for the AMS and the Bamboo Labs P1P and X1 Carbon that they now include, I believe, like their strain relief mods. Like, really? Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know that. They listen to their community. It's, yeah. it's awesome to see it. It helps save money. It helps make everyone happy. It, everyone wins. Everyone eats when you listen to community and you can let them help improve the product. Right. Yeah, yeah. We're always thinking about the future. We might not be working on it, but... Um, it's always in the back of our mind, like even at lunch, like we can't help but think about what's new, mm -hmm. but we're not always in free CAD working on it. We we keep the ideas moving. We keep the the text building product and we, we can carve out a minute for ourselves. We work on the next thing. Yeah. It's usually been like a no brainer. Like, OK, now we do this. Now there's time to do that. Yeah. There's downtime, like products are stable. There's breathing room to improve. And it's usually pretty obvious because we listen to the community. We do customer interviews. We know what it is that people care about. So when we have a minute from like helping production move along, like the like the day to day logistics of running the company, what to work on becomes pretty kind of almost obvious. And that's the goal. It, it, it should not really not be a struggle very often. If it is, maybe you should be spending more time paying attention to what people want. You know, if it's pretty clear, yeah, this is what we need to do then you're, you're doing a pretty good amount of customer research, I think. And like if you're getting a strong signal from your community, people are doing linear rails. People want, you know, this job set up to be faster. They want feeders. They want assembly faster. That's what you do. That's yeah. what you work on. So it's almost like the piece of advice there is to like keep your eye on that thread yeah. and follow it. Mm -hmm. And the, like the most sensible path should hopefully always stay visible. Right. And sometimes that path might take you down like a boring road, like making some really dry videos where Steven's not excited. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I just reading some pages to oh hi. I, I was trying right. I, I was trying to make find a thumbnail for this video of like setting up a job on your lumen, and I was scrubbing through like hours of footage just to find a place where I was smiling, <laughs> and I didn't find a single frame. Oh my god, of me smiling. I found one with a smirk, and I'm like, good enough. <laughs> this was like this is instructional. It is yeah. a and like it was a it was a long couple days, but I think this is going to help people so much in getting going with their machine. That's the product I'm working on right now is the documentation. That's the most important thing because that's the lowest hanging fruit. That's the most frustrating thing to people. That's the next shell in the onion of tolerance. It doesn't matter if it's new or existing. That's what you should be working on. That was a great question. Thanks for asking it. Yeah. If anyone has any other questions to ask us, shoot them our way in the the Lumen PMP Discord Mm -hmm. and we'd love to chat about them. This was awesome. And every time Steve and I sit down to talk, I think we learn something new here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize how how little we differentiate between a new product and an existing product. It's just kind of what do people want, you know? Like people have asked us so much, like, I don't have a 3D printer. I want strip feeders. Can you sell me strip feeders? And we didn't have that. And we're yeah. working on that now because that's what people need. And that's like a like a little pithy accessory. Like it's we pop them off a printer and we put them in a box and we ship it to somebody. But that's going to mean the world to somebody. So that should be something that we work 100%. on, you know, to be selling a new, totally new thing that like has its own accessories and ecosystem is to convince our customers that they have a problem and that we have a solution. And it's just it's almost easier to cater to the existing people. Yeah. And those people, if you're building your community out like that, those same people that use the Lumen are going to inform what reflow solution do you have? What stencil thing? Let's say we did decide to go into shoes. That's a totally new thing. Like nothing <laughs> that we existing that we sell already is going to really inform how we make shoes. Yeah. You know, like it's a completely different market or like you and I talk a lot about like, what if we made a Nerf gun? Yeah. It'd be really cool to make a Nerf blaster. And that that's a total blue sky thing. But pretty much anything else we think about, if we're still on mission for the company, it's related enough to our existing customer base that we can talk to our existing customers about it and they'll tell us what they want. Yeah, and uh, we could take try it this way. The kernel is the Lumen PMP as the main product and then it is helping people make things in-house. Mm-hmm. And new products kind of splinter out from there. Yeah, like yeah Whether really. we're talking about a reflow oven or solder paste application solutions. Sure. Like helping people solve a problem just informs existing versus new versus totally different vertical. Wow, yeah, I really never thought about it that way. It is kind of cool. Like new products versus existing products kind of doesn't, that's really not how we think about it. It's like, <laughs> what's the next thing to do? <laughs> when we sit, ship 12 mil, it's imperative to sell a spool holder if we can help it. Right. The customer has to hold the spool somehow. Right. <laughs> yeah, because they don't fit on the back of the 12 mil feeder, which is so funny. But yeah, that, that's true. Like, that's going to be a problem they're going to have that we need to solve. Yeah, and but, it's our job to anticipate those and yeah. like be ready to catch them when they notice that issue yeah. or that they have to solve this problem. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> It's really our whole thesis here is like, listen to what your customers want the most and go from there. (laughs) Yeah. If there isn't a customer that you can listen to, go find them. Yeah. I mean, if if you're not actively hunting them down, like I will send dozens of emails to customers and be like, hey, here's my Calendly link. Pick a time that you're free and then I'll just be busy for like three days just talking to customers back to back to back to back to back and take a bunch of notes, compile all of the data into like an Excel sheet, see the status of things. It's so helpful. Like you should just do it like once a quarter at least just to keep tabs on it, you know, see what pe- how people are feeling about it. And that way you stay really connected to what's important to work on. And if you listen to enough people, deciding what to prioritize becomes self-sorting. Like it sorts itself out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It <laughs> you'll, becomes... you'll realize exactly what is the most important because 50 people say one thing and only one person said the other. Right. And <laughs> there's also like, so I also think back to Chris from CNC Labs is talking about like everyone in the forums was don't use the Z probe because it'll break your bit. And sometimes the Henry Ford was kind of a butthead, but the, the <laughs> line of like, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have told me they wanted faster horses. I think about that line sometimes. And like, I think a lot of, especially our customers, cause like our customers are intelligent. They know this process. They know what they want from it. We can trust our customers to tell us what they truly want from this process. Cause they understand intimately what's going on with this whole machine, you know? So I don't think we have to apply very much of a filter of like, yeah, you're telling me you want this, but what you actually want is blank. (laughs) Maybe that is the case for different products. Like maybe someone says, hey, I just want the software to not force me to do the Z probe. What what they really want is the Z probe to work better. So listening to the problems that your customers have and then finding the best solution for it is your job. If they say, I want a full desktop conveyor belt system, what they mean is they want it to be as automated as possible. 
the desktop conveyor belt system might have a ton of logistic challenges that like maybe they haven't thought through the whole stack and that's okay it's not their job to but what they're telling you there is not they want this literal thing they want <laughs> something that is incredibly automated and that's what to take away from it so you know you also have to think about what could we make <laughs> you know what's reasonable if you all haven't listened to the episode with Chris about CNC Labs, it's episode four of the podcast. It was a great chat where we talked to him about how he makes all his open source CNC machines uh, with his co-founder, Andy. So go li- listen to that episode if you haven't already. Awesome talking to him. Yeah, it was a great chat. All right. I think we're good here. Yeah, I think so too. I hope you all learned something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so too. I did from this. I didn't realize that's kind of how we operated. Like we don't delineate at all, which is kind of interesting. Sure is something. <laughs> <laughs> do you disagree? Do you think we do delineate? Um, about like what to work on next. I'm thinking about like the idea of bringing in SMT accessories in house from like existing manufacturers. And like that's a new product for us. Yeah. I think it's all blurry. Yeah. We sometimes we think about reselling different accessories in the SMT world, but it goes towards like supporting our existing products and solutions better. Right. And like that is adding some value to the customer because then they can just like add to cart. It's all in the same place. It's a vetted source. It's like, Adafruit like sometimes they buy modules and stuff just from like an AliExpress vendor and what they really did is import it for you it's next day shipping and it's validated right like they vetted that this is a good product and that's the value they're providing and that's what we would do if we imported those things and that's still providing value that's making it easier for people to get a good solid source of a tool right now you kind of have to roll the dice with an Amazon Amazon special with like a stencil jig you know but if you get it from us we're vetting it we know it's good we have a warranty on it like it's good and that's still adding value in some way. It's just kind of a, that's not, that's not the most pressing thing right now for customers. People can still buy something on Amazon, you know? <laughs> it's very handy to make our customers' lives easier. I think about Lewis Rossman with RossmanStore.com, I think it is. And he sells salvaged ICs from MacBooks, components you can't buy from DigiKey. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and it's fascinating. And he also sells a hot air gun. Really? Yeah. If you're using his product, you probably need a hot air gun. Sure. That's true. <laughs> Might yep. as well get it from him. Right, right. If he's vouching for it and you trust him, Andy. Yeah, exactly. That means something. We'll cool. see that. All right, folks, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to leave a review wherever you get your podcast. It helps us out a ton. Give us five stars on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. You can also find Opulo on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also don't forget to check out Opulo.io and sign up for our newsletter, where we write blog posts and do customer interviews with other folks building open hardware. And we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. See ya. I, I was trying to make find a thumbnail for this video of like setting up a job on your lumen and I was scrubbing through like hours of footage just to find a place where I was smiling <laughs> and I didn't find a single frame oh my God. of me smiling. I had found one with a smirk and I'm like, good enough. <laughs>